Sunday evening. Subject. The Darkness. As many of you have already realized, I did not give up my intentions of crafting a document that, in an earlier section, I described as my ultimate statement. This document, or statement, had merely mutated into a different format, from a ranting declaration into what might be categorized as a paranormal memoir, a work in progress of uncertain form, very much like its creator. Among the principal elements to emerge in this latter form was that sinister presence whose sign and symbol had appeared to me as, one, a river of blackness, two, a constellation of dark stars which filled the darkness behind the darkness of the night sky, three, dark spots that, despite my enhanced perception of the world around me, still obscured certain crucial things from my view, most prominently any knowledge concerning the peculiar, non-living state in which I now existed, and four, stains or smudges of darkness which spread across the night sky at all hours and grew increasingly prominent each time I knocked the living daylights out of one of the seven, plus Chipman. At the time specified above, it was the last of these four phenomena that most preoccupied me, given that I had eliminated no fewer than three persons before sundown, which, of course, was still an hour behind on the clocks in my time zone and would remain so for one more October day. Even during the later hours of Thursday afternoon, following my annihilation of Sherry Mercer and the man I knew as Harry Smith Jones, the world outside my apartment windows was stuck in a shade of deep twilight as far as I could see. The dark stains hovered in the sky above the old buildings of the downtown area and extended into the distance across the river, creating a cityscape that was so evenly overcast that it took on the phony look of a stage setting or a day-for-night scene in a low-budget movie. Furthermore, some time after I sent Chipman to his doom, there was a definite moment when things took on a still darker tint, as if to mark the precise time when the young supervisor could no longer deny to himself the heart-stopping fact that he would never find his way to the end of that infinite series of doors. Clearly, a pattern was discernible in these darkenings that came upon the heels of each act of uncanny mayhem that I worked upon my former colleagues. I wondered if this was a sign of one of those stupid rules that encumbered us all, living or non-living, a law of limitation that read, this far and no farther, or possibly, this many and no more. Anyhow, after a rather busy day of putting down bad beasts, I decided to pause that evening to reflect upon this pattern I had observed. As I lay, in bodily form, on the sofa in the living room of my apartment, that wonderfully bleak penthouse above Lillian's downtown diner, I roughly estimated that at the rate that these darkenings were encroaching on my world, I would be able to eliminate my remaining co-workers, that is, my erstwhile co-workers, just before I myself was plunged into a realm of permanent and total darkness, sinking back into that metaphorical river of blackness from which I had, by means unknown to me, somehow escaped before I had become entirely submerged into its greasy waters. This realization, if it wasn't purely a matter of imagination, I thought, was a disheartening one, because as satisfying as I found my work of exterminating these vermin in whatever bizarre manner I could conceive, my mind had already begun turning toward bigger things, more elaborate schemes on a far greater scale. After all, the planet that I inhabited, the reality in which I was captured, was brimming with all kinds of potential victims, all of whom, to some degree, were swine that I dearly wanted to lead into my house of slaughter. This feeling of mine, this passion, was absolutely confirmed and bolstered during those moments when I had occupied the body of Lillian Hayes for the purpose of liquidating, in a literal sense, Harry the robber and rapist. Now here was a woman who, I believed, was as decent as anyone could be, as close to being a non-swine as any human being could get, 
And yet all the time that I inhabited her physical body, I could feel how intimately that body, in both its physical and metaphysical aspects, was connected to that now familiar darkness, that sinister presence, a presence that might well have been named the Great Black Swine, a grunting, bestial force that animated, that used our bodies to frolic in whatever mucky thing came its way, lasciviously agitating itself in that black river in which the human species only bobbed about like hunks of excrement. Indeed, after inhabiting the body of another, in this case the body of Lillian Hayes, it seemed to me that the idea of a human species, of anything like a person, or persons known or unknown, was only a figure of speech, a convenient delusion. Then, sometime between dumping Harry in the soup and sending Chipman into a maddening oblivion, it occurred to me, all of them must be done away with. Everyone must go. And as I lay on the sofa in the living room of my apartment, I could only lament that I would not be able to continue my work beyond the seven, Chipman notwithstanding. A limit had been placed on my labors before the blackness would close in on me entirely. I was still being manipulated. I was still being crowded and conspired against by something beyond my control and frustrating to my will. But then something happened, right in the living room of my apartment, that served to reconcile me to this situation, or at least instill in my soul a sense of grim resignation. It took the form of a cockroach scuttling across the carpet. I jumped up from the sofa and, with a rapidity and precision that came along with my peculiar state of existence, I trapped the creature beneath my heavy black boot without killing it. Even through the thick sole of that boot I could feel the bugs scuttling in place. At this point I was merely in physical connection with it. Next, I established a deeper communion with this vermin, letting a little bit of myself flow into its body, linking me to its life in the same manner that I had joined myself to Lillian Hayes. Although my immersion into the roach was not as complete as it had been with Lillian, I nonetheless felt the exact same sensation. There was nothing especially roachy inside the roach any more than there was anything of a distinct person inside of Lillian. Once the dark interior of each had been penetrated, there was only that buzz of swinish agitation and turbulent blackness. The great black swine was thrashing about inside the cockroach, just as it had within Lillian Hayes, the only difference being that any sense of delusion about being some kind of thing in the world was missing from the insect, or perhaps it was only so faint that I could not detect it. Was it simply a matter of degree? Between the cockroach and the proprietor of the Metro Diner there spread quite a spectrum of organic life. Was there a corresponding spectrum of delusion about being things in the world? For instance, I've noticed, and who hasn't, that cats seem to regard themselves in a way very similar to that of humans, and vice versa. Cats are people, I heard the voice of an old woman speak from somewhere in my memory. And from a feline perspective, people might very well seem to be cats. And inside of all of them, the thrashing agitation of the devouring swine, the conspiratorial swine, and, yes, the murdering swine. This was the only thing in the world. The rest of it was only costumes and masks, the inventory of an ancient and still flourishing theatrical supply company. And they would all have to go. People, cats, roaches, plants, all of it had to go. But I knew that I, whatever I was, would not be the one to do it. The work was too immense, the scale of slaughter impossible to attain, the assurance that every speck of living matter had been swept from this world, and what about all the other worlds, would have to remain in the realm of never to be, the beatific dream of an obsessive compulsive life form. However, it was all over for the roach.
When I pressed my boot down to the floor, I could feel everything go still and silent within that little body where before there had been only a vicious thrashing and blackness. I even felt a little part of myself, the part of me I had allowed to leak into the bug, grow still and silent. It felt good, very good, however fleeting the feeling had been. I can truly say that it was the only moment of real well-being I had ever experienced in my life, if my present state of existence could in fact be considered part of that fabrication I called my life. And at that moment I was sure that I was still living in some way, that even if I was not entirely alive, neither was I wholly dead. Somehow I was caught in between these two worlds, caught in a place where I had made a rare connection with that great black swine, that thrashing and vicious blackness which flowed like a river through every living thing, and possibly in the spaces around everything that lived allowing me to be wherever the blackness flowed, to become one with this agitated force that was everywhere and inside everything, that moved and manipulated all the created life of this world and gave me the power to move and manipulate things according to my will, which was nevertheless only the lowercase will of an isolated being, a cockroach elevated to human form, a small swirling of that flowing blackness that was as great and enduring as the world itself, that was the secret face of the living world, the shadow within all life, the thing that would live on and on as each one of us died our deaths alone, because whatever life we had was only its life, and when our bodies, our cockroach bodies, became too damaged to accommodate it, this blackness flowed away, leaving behind it a dead vine, a bug's crushed carapace, or a human corpse, things that had no life of their own, nothing real at all about them. Yet if my life was all delusion, it was an inescapable delusion that I, and alas even you, could not fail to follow wherever it might lead and I still had four more beings to blow away from this creepy existence. Until that was accomplished, my work was not yet done, and my life, or non-life as it were, seemed undeniably worth living. Somehow I had been given the power to finish the work I had begun when I entered that downtown gun shop to purchase a load of firearms and a buckskinner hunting knife. I, and you, now understood. We were brought into this world out of nothing. I and you now understood. We were kept alive in some form, any form, as long as we were viciously thrashing about, acting out our most intensely vital impulses, never allowed to become still and silent until every drop had been drained of the blackness flowing inside us. I and you now understood we would be pulled back into the flowing blackness only when we had done all the damage we were allowed to do, only when our work was done, the work of you against me, and me against you. 2. On Friday morning the homicide detectives were sitting in their unmarked car just down the street from the gun shop where once upon a time I had planned to pick up a few things. The store was supposed to open at ten o'clock, but they arrived a half hour early. There they were, sipping coffees and lackadaisically eyeing whatever came into their field of vision. I was sitting, unseeable, in the back seat, thinking to myself, do you really think that I'm going to make an appearance to pick up my order? You guys are either very thorough or very stupid. Then Detective White said something that put me in my place. You know we're wasting our time here, don't you? Yup, said Detective Black. No way he's going to show up. You know why the lieutenant ordered this stakeout, don't you? Yup, it's not like this is the first time. But it still stinks. Take it easy. Here, have a bagel, said Detective Black as he reached into a paper bag. Detective White took the bagel and tore into it like an angry dog. This isn't the place we should be. 
we should be questioning those execs at the company, with or without their lawyers. That's not what the lieutenant wants. That's not what he wants because he got the word. The word from the man who got the word from the man, said Detective Black. You know how many people have stopped showing up for work at that place? I know. I'd like to have a talk with the ones that are still left, said Detective White as his full set of remarkably square teeth tore off another hunk of bagel, and he continued to talk with his mouth full. They're the ones who know what's going on. I don't like it when people tell me that I shouldn't try to find out what's really going on. You know the score, said Detective Black. That's a big company. What's going on there is probably not good for their business. They should let us do our job. I agree. People should know what really goes on in this city, said Detective White. I'd like to know myself sometimes, but what can you do? Nothing. Want another bagel? said Detective Black as he helped himself to one of the poppy seed variety. Detective White waved off seconds on the bagels and continued gazing lackadaisically through the windshield of the unmarked car. If I hadn't already known what I knew about certain things, I might have thought to myself, you guys are... All right, then, said Richard to his gathered underlings in the usual meeting place. He had already tried to contact Chipman, both at home and at work, but he didn't seem surprised at the young man's absence. But what could he say to the others about Chipman, not to mention the empty chairs once occupied by Sherry and Harry? Come on, Richard, tell them what you know about Domino. Tell me what you know. Like Detective White, I wanted to know what was going on. Mary and Kerry were sitting to the left and right of Richard, while Barry had positioned himself at the far end of the table. Why don't you move in a little closer, Barry boy? said Richard. Covering her mouth, Mary whispered, He smells really bad, Richard. I think he's sick. I'm, uh, fine where I am, said Barry, and that ended the issue. So where do we go from here, Rich? said a cocky Sherry. Richard eyed Carrie as if she were a talking whippet, which in fact she resembled, and then spoke softly to her. You should probably be taking this situation more seriously, Carrie. I have no fear whatever of Frank Dominio. I just wish he'd try something with me. I'm ready, she said, patting a slight bulge in the pocket of the sports coat she wore every day with a t-shirt, jeans, and athletic shoes. I'm afraid I can't say the same, said Mary. Is there any point in bringing up the others who couldn't be with us today? None at all, Mary, said Richard with a businesslike finality. What about you, Barry? Any apprehensions at your end of the table? Barry just stared without any focus, like a lobotomy case. Then he sniffed, actually snorted, very loudly and scratched his armpit. He was clearly having a hard time following the proceedings. One, and that one would be me might say that Barry was no longer his old brilliant self. Then what's the point of this meeting? said Mary, her mask of makeup shining with perspiration. Everything, all our plans. What I mean to say is, it's over, isn't it? It's not over until it's over, spoke Richard. The important thing is to maintain appearances. None of us has anything to hide. Oh, come on said Carrie. Frank's out there doing us one by one, but we did him first. We certainly didn't do any violence to him, said Richard. We just wanted something that he had. And once we got that, what? You're the doctor, Richard. We know what that means. Richard sighed with infinite boredom. Is anyone here going to back Carrie up in her accusations? Mary bit her lower lip smearing her upper teeth with a layer of lipstick. Barry continued to scratch and sniff snort. I still wanted Richard to tell him what he knew about Domino, but it was now obvious that this was not going to happen. The whole point of that meeting was damage control for Richard, and he knew, as I did, that the damage wasn't over. 
3. My taste for the grotesque was neither an inborn nor a long-standing trait of my character. Rather, it was conceived and developed over the period of time encompassed by this document, my ultimate statement. By Friday, the last Friday of October, this taste, which was already as ripe as the fruits of an autumn harvest, had finally gone thoroughly rotten. It was now an unslakable hunger for unheard of horrors, for all the derangements bred by the most morbid fevers, and for the stuff of nightmares so twisted, so aberrant, that they were beyond the comprehension or recall of the waking mind. Please let me show you, all of you, what I did that day. It began with Barry. Actually, I had intended Barry, rather than Perry, as my first project, given that this waddling wretch had been Richard's primary tool in my decline and fall at the company. However, good sense overcame vengeful rage, and I decided to begin practicing on the piano player, whose annihilation may now be seen to have been a simple finger exercise compared to my later work, while saving the more choice subjects for later, when I had reached the height of my monstrous powers. Nevertheless, Barry remained a side project for me from the beginning. His slow wit and strong odor at the meeting on Friday were merely superficial signs that this swine was ready for the market. Barry left the office well before lunch. He no longer felt comfortable in such structured, correction, restructured, surroundings. All he wanted was to get back to his brick house, no house of straw or clay for this piggy, where things were just the way he now liked them. As he drove his car through a winding route of city streets, he was no longer mentally competent to handle the high speeds and quick thinking required to maneuver on the expressway. The only thoughts in his head were images of home. This place, to describe it with a minimum of foul details, was a sty, literally. These images which now filled Barry's beasty brain, since his ability to think in words and concepts had almost entirely atrophied, consisted wholly of wallowing in filth, which included the remains of the filth that he heaped into his body, as well as the filth that emanated out of that same body and was spread over every inch of his floor and furnishings. Barry's brick bungalow was truly hog heaven, and he could hardly wait to strip off his human clothes and roll his flabby, naked flesh around in the slop, snorting and squealing all the while. But Barry's mind was not yet so intellectually impaired that he couldn't make a few stops at the drive through windows of several fast food joints on his way home, filling both the front and back seats of his car with bags and bags of burgers, tacos, and crusty hunks of fried chicken. It was at his last stop, a rib shack, that Barry caught the scent of something else that tantalized his tastes, although it was not something he could eat. It so happened that Barry's drive home led him directly past the state fairgrounds, which were now in the full swing of a fall exhibition that included a midway of concession stands bursting with corn dogs and cotton candy, an amphitheater that filled the air with country music, and the usual showing of agricultural products from both field and barnyard. This was Barry's lucky day, and mine. Without thinking twice, or even once, Barry pulled his car into the fairgrounds parking lot, and, after gobbling a bag or so of sustenance, he wandered into the festive world of the fair. He was following that overpowering scent, and, in his blind search, he disappeared into the crowd, disappeared forever. The only hint of what might have become of Barry Edwins was an item that appeared the next day in the city's major newspaper and was reprinted in several other publications in outstate regions. The facts were these. First, someone reported to the police who were keeping order at the state fair that she had seen a naked man trying to couple with a prize pig featured at a livestock exhibition. Second, when the police arrived at the exhibition, that nasty, naked man was nowhere to be found. 
What they did find, however, was a rape in progress, but it was the act of a pinkish hog upon a blue ribbon sow. Third, no one could be found who would claim the offending hog as theirs. One old livestock breeder did note that the genitalia of the hog, while quite small, were still intact. That is, this was an animal that had not been properly fixed for its breed and ultimate purpose. Last, granted permission by the police to do what needed to be done in exchange for taking ownership of this rather fine specimen of its type, the old livestock breeder castrated the animal on the spot in order to bring it under control and promise that, by and by, this handsome hog would find a home at a good slaughterhouse. To commemorate this turn of events, I directed a blech email message to Richard's computer under the subject line of, what else, work not done. But I was denied the satisfaction of seeing Richard read this message. In fact, I seem to have lost the ability to locate him altogether. This was something that threw a scare into me because there was only one place that he could have hidden himself from my view. Somehow Richard had gone into a dark spot, but I couldn't be sure why or how this had happened. Hadn't I always been given free rein to do my work? Never mind, I told myself. There was other work to be done. And there she was. Mary. After the mess that the cleaning staff found in Sherry Mercer's office, Mary tried to spend as little time as possible in her own, or anywhere else in the company's office space if she could help it. Her heels were now clicking upon the sidewalks of downtown toward her favorite lunch spot, which would be filled with a crowd of people among whom she would feel relatively safe. However, as not luck but I would have it, Mary walked right by her destination, and she kept on walking toward the outskirts of the business section of the city, wandering through run-down neighborhoods and past many of my once favorite ruined buildings, including an old place that still had a sign in the window that read, Rooms for Men. But my feeling for these places was a thing of the past for me, the soothingness of Sabi with its mind-clearing desolation and soul-calming decrepitude, had now been replaced by my taste for the grotesque. Nothing but the grotesque would gratify my howling mind and poisoned soul. Only the grotesque. So I took Mary out of the range of vast empty fields and beautifully gutted buildings, dropping her off at a place known as the Mechanic Street Museum. This nominal museum was spread out along a block of abandoned houses not far from a railroad overpass and across the road from a dumping ground for old sofas and chairs, old tires, old medicine cabinets, and any other expired object you cared to name. The exhibits of the museum consisted entirely of old dolls and mannequins, or the various parts of same. These human simulations inhabited both the interior spaces of each abandoned house as well as populating their front yards. Behind any given window, often shattered, of the houses along this section of Mechanic Street, one might see an entire mannequin, sometimes clothed or partially clothed, and sometimes not, or at least part of a mannequin such as a slim forearm and hand held in place by some putty on the inside window sill. Additionally, these windows might display a doll hanging by its neck as if from a gibbet, or simply the head of a doll dangling at the end of a wire. This community of dolls and mannequins also lounged upon the wooden porches or the steps leading up to these porches, and sometimes peered out from the exposed crawl spaces beneath a number of the abandoned houses. Most interesting were the dolls and mannequins that had been set up in old chairs or sofas taken from the dumping ground across the street. The dolls leaned crookedly in chairs that were invariably too large for them while the mannequins lay in twisted postures upon sofas without cushions. No one had ever claimed credit for creating this museum, which had attained modest renown in both local publications and nationally distributed art journals. 
nor had anyone ever been caught, though many had tried, in the act of augmenting its exhibitions, filling the mechanic street houses and their yards with still more dolls and mannequins, and replacing the ones that had become too damaged, either by vandals or the elements, to remain on display. As I earlier explained, Mary Dreller had been led astray into the region of the Mechanic Street Museum while on her way to an out-of-office lunch. No one at the company noticed that she had not logged off her computer, and it was assumed that she, not unlike Barry Edwins, had left work early that Friday. It wasn't until later the same night that her husband reported her to the police as a missing person. The police, of course, would never find Mary, but I will tell you, whoever you are or think you are, just who did find her and where she was found. It was a few hours after sunset, EDT, that a couple of derelicts, both of them drunken and deranged, were passing through the Mechanic Street Museum. They had covered this ground before and were not daunted by its peculiar aspects, quite the opposite, in fact. Pausing in front of a house where a doll's head stared from a high attic window, the derelicts parked themselves on either side of a sofa near the sidewalk. Between them was a fully clothed mannequin sitting up with fair posture, although her head was twisted over the back of the sofa. Out of all the mannequins these derelicts had ever seen loitering in the vicinity, this one came closest to something that could be mistaken for a human being. Must be a new one, said the first derelict. Yeah, said the other. But, er, look at her face. As drunken and deranged as the derelicts were, even they could not overlook the flaw in this window dummy. Specifically, its face did not display the requisite expression of bland beatitude, but, on the contrary, was severely contorted, the face of something that was frozen in a moment of panic. I bet we could get something for these clothes, said the first derelict, running his dirty hands from top to bottom over the mannequin's body. It's got stockings, even. Let's take off her clothes, said the other. As the derelicts proceeded to undress the mannequin, they were further amazed that it was outfitted with underclothing. The first derelict started talking to the dummy, calling her Daisy, and then the other derelict joined in the fantasy. One thing led to another, and by the time Daisy was fully rid of her clothes, the derelicts had laid this fake lady of the evening across the sofa and began taking turns on top of her. That night there was a full moon over Mechanic Street, and these derelicts were evidently in the mood for a little messing around even if their object of desire was merely a mannequin, although one that might be easily mistaken, as she had been for years, for a human being. Then one of the derelicts suddenly jumped off the dummy, stumbling backward with his pants around his ankles. Her eyes, he said. They, they were looking back at me. The other derelict, zipping himself up, stepped closer to the thing spread out on the cushionless sofa. Oh, my God, he groaned. Then both of the derelicts, having pushed the mannequin onto the sidewalk, began stomping on her face and assaulting her body with a piece of metal pipe that was lying on the ground nearby. What they found inside the mannequin turned out to be even more distressing to them than her contorted face or her eyes that looked back into theirs for beneath its plaster exterior was an anatomically correct set of bodily organs, even if they too seemed to be made of artificial materials. If the derelicts had had the presence of mind, or any useful minds at all, they might have rationalized this horrific figure as a construct intended for use in the medical school at the university, which was only a few miles away. Instead, they kept pummeling away at the unnatural thing, especially its face, until nothing remained but a heap of shattered plaster. They even left its clothes behind as they broke into a breathless, stumbling flight from the Mechanic Street Museum. While the episode with Mary was quite a success, if somewhat lacking in imagination, I had already used the mannequin theme in dispatching Perry Stokowski. 
the satisfaction I derived from its grotesquerie was undermined by my continuing failure to locate Richard. I had always intended him to be the last of the seven upon whom I would visit my wrath. Now I was beginning to worry that something was wrong. Visions of a doctor with great white gloves were beginning to disturb my, let's admit it, hopelessly disturbed mind. I left a message of work not done on the voicemail of both his home phone and his cell phone, but Richard was not picking up my communications, I could tell. Forget it, I told myself. You, and you was me, should be turning your attention to the penultimate person on the list. Carrie. I found her sometime after midnight. She was parking her car in front of a club that, big surprise, catered to patrons of sadomasochistic impulses. The club, which displayed no sign to betray its name or nature, was located in the warehouse district not far from the river and was set up in a battered old building that I once might have looked upon as a ruin suitable for my meditations and my camera. But this building was alight with a hazy red glow, a private place halfway along a pitted road without street lamps and under a sky that, for me in any case, was filled only with those dark constellations which put a blackout on all the stars above. And after my self-designed run-in with Carrie, the sky would become even darker. Despite the sadomasochistic rationale for the club's existence, its decor had nothing of the oubliette about it, nothing at all to distinguish it as a palace of pain and humiliation. Some paper pumpkins and skulls had been strung over a small bar in anticipation of the upcoming All Hallows, although in every other respect it resembled an old-fashioned neighborhood saloon. Like the company where I was once employed, the owner of this operation was obviously dedicated to the standard business principle of offering his clientele the least, a few tables and chairs, some wobbly stools along the bar, for the most, a sky-high cover charge and outrageously priced drinks from the bottom of their respective barrels. Even this purported haven for the deviant, the outsider, functioned along the mainstream goal of commerce, always aiming for the fiscal ideal of everything for them, the sellers and sellers out of the world, and zero for, well, everyone was them to me now, at least in the sense that neither corporate nor even corporeal dealings were any longer my business. Or so I told myself, even though the whole picture was not mine to see. And somewhere in the darkness of that October night, Richard was still hiding from me in some dark spot where I could not find him, as I had so easily tracked down Carrie to this hole-in-the-wall hangout. And I needed to find him, to finish up my work, before everything became for me one great world of darkness. Yet I continued to believe that my calculations were correct. The damage that was given to me to do was compounded at a fixed rate, and there remained enough principle in my account of worldly existence for me to complete the task I had started. None of the seven, or myself, would ever see another sunrise. None of us would reclaim that hour which had been stolen by the daylight savings of the previous spring and was not scheduled to be returned for approximately another twenty-four hours or so. But what was an hour, a day, a year, or ten? There's always plenty of time for the worst. Everyone is old enough to face their fate. And so was Carrie Keen. She had just walked in the door, carrying in one hand a leather bag that was not a purse. Wearing her usual outfit, she swaggered toward the far end of the bar and leaned over to ask the barman, Is the can here yet? He's waiting for you downstairs, said the barman as he tossed Carrie a key dangling at the end of a red plastic disc. Carrie immediately strode toward a curtained doorway that led downstairs, which was a complex of rooms set up like a subterranean motel, and a very cheap motel at that. After moving down several hallways, turning left here and right there without the least hesitation, she stopped at a certain door and let herself in. 
On the other side was a small bare room that appeared in the same light of garish red that illuminated the bar upstairs and the corridors below. In the shadows of one corner of the room, a short, flabby man was on his knees with lowered head, as if he were praying. He didn't even look up when Carrie stormed into the room and slammed the door behind her. And he didn't look up when Carrie threw her leather bag on the floor and stripped off her sport coat, revealing two skinny arms springing forth from a sleeveless t-shirt. Hello, Ken, she said to the man in the corner, who still did not raise his eyes to her. I've brought something special for you tonight. Can, I already knew from previous research, I had always been thorough in my work, was a pseudonym that to Carrie and to most of those around the SM scene was short for human garbage can. But before Carrie could begin making use of this living receptacle, packing it full of that special sort of offal she had brought with her this night, she realized something was wrong. The can seemed to have gone stiff as a statue. None of the usual words of worship and submission that Carrie was accustomed to hearing at this point in the ritual were uttered by the short, flabby, and naked man. She walked across the floor and laid several slaps, both backhand and forehand, on the can's pudgy face. But there was no response from the figure still postured as though in silent prayer. Then the door opened, and I walked into the room in all my black attire, including a zippered leather mask over my face. You've got the wrong room, masked man. Take a walk. The masked man stood heroically mute and perfectly rigid, staring at Carrie through a pair of eye holes with thick, almost surgical stitching around them. Then he reached into his coat pocket and took out something small and circular, tossing it into Carrie's hands. The second she realized it was a fresh roll of stamps, she moved toward her sport coat that had made a clunk when she first threw it on the floor. The masked man was quicker than Carrie and pushed her against the wall, being careful not to push too hard before she could retrieve her weapon. Then the masked man moved with all speed and pulled the firearm from Carrie's jacket. It was a Glock. And it felt so fine in my fingers as I clicked off the safety and aimed the barrel at Carrie's head. She had pressed her body flush against the cinder block wall, standing as if before a firing squad. This was how I had originally imagined my work would be done. If it hadn't been for... paper? I was sick of having my mind harassed by paper moons and paper plates, paper products of all kinds, both figurative and literal. Why couldn't I break through those dark spots and remember? Everything could have been so much easier, so much quicker, and far less grotesque for everyone concerned if things had only gone according to plan. Even now I was tempted to install the full magazine of the gun into Carrie's body and leave it at that. But I already had other plans in place. I had been thorough, as always, in my research. Do you know why he's called the can? I asked Carrie. Go to hell. Why don't you just shoot? I asked you if you knew, really knew, why he's called the can. He pretends he's a garbage can. He eats. He eats whatever you put in his mouth. He swallows it and begs for more. Do me a favor and move a little closer to Mr. Can, I said, directing her toward the paralyzed figure in the corner. Closer still, Carrie, right up against his body, as if you were riding him piggyback. There, that's close enough. Close enough for what? she asked, a satisfying quiver of fear in her voice. Then I set my plans in motion and her body began to sink down into his. She struggled. She even screamed. But this was not a place where screams were taken seriously at first. Besides, the door was heavy and it was locked. I continued my conversation with Carrie as a monologue, since she was sinking fast into the flabby man's flesh and had begun choking on her own horror. You're right about Mr. Can. He does eat whatever you, or someone like you, puts in his mouth. 
but he also eats other things. He's not just a garbage can, Carrie. What you never knew about Mr. Can is that not only does he have a secret life that he lives out in places like this, he also has a secret, secret life that he would never have told you about. By night he's the human garbage can you know but probably do not love. In an even darker night of his soul, Mr. Can is... He's... Well, there's just no subtle way I can say this. He's a cannibal. And soon you're going to be made one with him. Your brain buried inside of his brain. Your nervous system integrated into his. Your desires bound to his desires. Unfortunately, you will be denied all muscular control. You'll exist something like a parasitic organism inside him. A tapeworm, if you like. But he won't be bothered by you. He'll continue to eat as you've always known him to eat. And you will know that you are eating the same things. He will also eat as you never knew him to eat. There are others like him, and he is in league with them. Mostly they consume homeless persons who have fallen unnoticed by the wayside. Sometimes they give them a little help in their going. On rare occasions they eat living food. Are you aware of the word that cannibals who once occupied islands in the South Pacific used for human being? It translates as the food that talks. Mr. Can and others of his kind live to eat. I know that was never your style, Carrie, but from now on it will be, as long as Mr. Can lives. And you know what? He's even made special preparations with his fellow cannibals for the day when he will be too dead to chew his food. It seems to be their desire, don't ask me why, that after their demise they be buried naked in secret ground. After their life of eating is over, their final wish is to become food for other forms of life. It's rather spiritual, don't you think? The great circle of being and all that. Of course, just because Mr. Can is dead doesn't necessarily mean that you'll join him. You're so much younger, so much healthier, even given your anorexic mania, than he is. I'm guessing that the little parasite inside him will outlive his body by a certain term, although I can't say how long that will be. Can you still hear me, Carrie? You're sliding down into him so fast. It's almost as if you can't wait to get inside. Prick up your ears if you'd like to hear more. But she was gone, and so was I. Wake up, Mr. Can, I said to the man in the corner just before I left the room. 4. After leaving Carrie and Mr. Can behind in that shed-like room, I sent out my last message to Richard, work not done, in case you forgot using every possible means of communication, including the barking dog in the backyard next door to Richard's house, some writing in chalky deodorant on his bathroom mirror, and even telepathy, which I knew from the beginning of this whole heinous saga was not a strength of mine. But once again I failed to raise him by wireless means, and I still could not locate his position on my radar. The streets outside were now so death-darkened that I could no longer make my way on foot. Even when I switched to traveling by means of spectral byways, at which I had become so adept, I found that I was no longer master of these roads. All the routes that were familiar to me seemed to have changed, mostly into a series of dead ends. I felt as if I were trying to negotiate a maze that was not taking me where I wanted to go, but where it wanted me to go. And when I finally reached what I thought was the way to freedom, I discovered that I was still not outside the maze, but at its very center. And that center was the old meeting room which was outside company space, even if it was deep inside the world of Richard the Minotaur. I resumed worldly appearances and opened the door to the room. While always dim, the place had never looked dimmer to my eyes than it did at that moment. Nevertheless, I ventured across the floor of the room in corporate form. I walked to the table in corporate form, and in corporate form I took a seat at that table where, 
At the opposite end sat Richard. I'm glad you made it here, he said. I don't think I had much choice. But this is where you want to be. Nothing else really matters anymore. I'm glad you're resigned to the facts. You mean because you're here to do some terrible deed? My very worst, I said, although not as convincingly as I would have liked. Your worst, I'm sure. All because I made you feel bad. That really proves it. You haven't learned anything. And after what you've been through. Illusions don't die that easily. Whatever I've learned doesn't really matter. I'm still Domino as long as you exist. You mean as long as you exist. That's right. You said that you knew I wasn't a dead man. Oh, that was just some simple detective work. Then why wasn't it done by the real detectives? Because they didn't know what I knew. They had you down from the start as a suspect in Perry's. Before I forget, why the mannequin hands? That was fairly crude. I thought it appropriate. What's the difference? All right, I didn't know how far I could take things at the time. Now tell me what it was the detectives didn't know. It was an assumption they made. Considering what happened to Perry, they naturally felt you were up and around in the usual manner of mad dog murderers. How could they know that this was rather far from the case? When they ran the check on your credit card purchases the day you were... The day you resigned, they quite reasonably focused on your visit to the gun shop. They didn't consider it important that you later picked up a few things at that office supply store, although they did ask me if I thought that was significant. But I just shrugged like an innocent. I must have given Richard the blankest look in the world when he started talking about the office supply store. I remembered buying the guns. I remembered buying the clothes. I remembered suddenly being back in my apartment that night, how confused I was, and how I was in such a terrible funk because I didn't know whether I was alive or dead. I didn't think I had the strength to pick up a piece of paper, and the idea of paper left a chilling echo in my mind. Do you see now? You weren't able to remember buying those reams of paper, Richard continued. It's strange how some things are just blocked from your brain. What would you know about that? Not as much as you, I'm sure. But I do have your interest now, don't I? So you're going to listen to me crow about how I deduced what became of Little Domino. I don't have to listen to anything, I said, pulling my buckskin or hunting knife from my pocket and laying it on the table. Wow. That is a real hand chopper. There are some people I'd like to use that on myself. Do you think you're the only one who has scores to settle? It's not a question of whether the punishment fits the crime, is it? Not to swines like us. It's just a matter of getting that pain out of your system and into someone else's. It's a dark world. Nothing but darkness. And whose business is it but our own what goes on in the dark? I wanted to be calm and menacing. I wanted to be a creature of murder lust, a monster of all madnesses. I wanted to do things to Richard that would make the sun grow cold with horror. But I couldn't help following his script. Naturally, I have my confusions about what I am, what I became. But I didn't expect to find myself wondering what on earth you are. Me? said Richard. I'm a person just like you. Well, not exactly like you. You're a miracle man. You didn't know that. A medical marvel. As I was saying, once your presence at the office supply store was established, it only remained to check out in the local papers if anything else of interest had happened around those corners that night. As Richard spoke these words, a deafening sound came into my head. The sound of crashing and crunching, of metal and bone and screams and screams and screams. Then the sound of a roaring black river. It was a bus, Frank. The last of the line for the night. 
The driver was fully exonerated, if you care to know. You ran like a big black bird right in front of him, as several eyewitnesses told the officers at the scene. You were literally mashed to a pulp, completely unrecognizable as a human being, let alone anyone in particular, especially since you weren't carrying any identification on your person. That wasn't very smart. Then I am a dead man, I said aloud to myself. Everyone who saw that gruesome accident thought you were. Some of them said they didn't know which was worse, seeing your body all smeared and twisted in ways no one should have to see, or finding out that you were still alive, comatose but alive. I visited you a few times. Of course there wasn't, I'm sorry isn't, anything to see but a heap of bandages and a rather small heap at that, blood pooling through the gauze. But the fascinating part was the brain waves you were putting out on the EEG. Before I got there, they didn't think there was any point in hooking you up to it, but I can play a pretty convincing medicine man when I want to. I told them I was a specialist and that I'd known cases like this before. You should have seen the look on their faces when that monitor started skipping and jumping all over the place. That was when I knew you were going to be a problem for me. How could you know that? That's a strange question coming from you, Domino. I might just as well ask how you knew how to do the things you did. I'm not requesting details. I heard Chipman's voice when he described Sherry Mercer's office. He saw something in there that I never want to know about. And that's not even considering what became of the young man himself. It was bad enough getting those work not done messages whenever another one of the group seemed to just disappear. But I knew what I was getting myself into when I hired you. You and the rest of them. But it was you, Frank. You were the blackest of the bunch. I could see it in you from the start. Believe me, I know all about it. We, all of us, are the darkness that dreams are made on. I'm not claiming that I'm special in any way. It doesn't take anything more than a pair of clear eyes to see what makes the world go round. I've known about it since I was a child. Was it my fault that I liked to stare into the shadows until they started to stare back into me? That I performed little operations on stray animals? I really did want to be a doctor at that time in my life. But when I put my hands inside those creatures, I never expected to feel what was really in there. It wasn't until I was older that I knew what I had felt inside them was also inside of me. That there wasn't anything else inside except that darkness. I thought about killing myself, but that wasn't the way for me. It had other plans for my life, and there wasn't much I could do except carry them out. It's my kind that calls the shots in this world, but we didn't ask for the job. Most of the time we think we're making our own agendas, following assignments that come from our own brains, or from above, almost never from below except perhaps in those strictly legendary instances wherein some poor boob thinks he's made himself a deal with the devil. What a load of crap that is. I'm not looking for your sympathy, Frank. Wouldn't that be deranged? I just wanted you to know that I have some idea of what you've been up to, not to mention up against, these past few days. It was strange what happened with you, but I don't think it was an accident. Most people have no idea what goes on in this world, but you know what it likes. It likes fear and agitation and conflict and all that stuff that makes such good copy for those folks who are selling that sort of thing. Never mind all the sideliners whose happy lot is merely to peek in the window of the torture shop of life. I wanted you to know that I knew about that too. That's all I had to say. So what now? I've gotten very good lately at coming up with fates worse than death. How about one of those? I said. 
but my words sounded hollow even to me. I was still afraid, not of Richard himself, but of what was inside him, of what had been using him, and myself, as such obliging organisms for the most vicious and sinister acts. You can do whatever you want to me, sure, he said, but unless I'm completely out of touch with things, you just barely made it here, and you're looking at me as if I'm standing in a black fog. Do you think you can do what you want to me and still make it to your next stop? That's where all of this is really heading for you, isn't it? Come on, you can't lie to me. He was right, of course. I couldn't lie to him, but I didn't think I needed to lie. I believe you're right, Richard. What happened to me wasn't an accident, and it won't be over until my allotted body count is tallied up. There were seven of you. Correct. And it was seven that you took. You didn't think about Chipman, did you? He never made much of an impression on anyone, but he was the joker I planted in the deck. If you waste the last bit of light you have left on me, you'll never make it to where you want to go. It's a terrible choice you have to make. I'm sure you'd like to step into the blackness inside me and dance around in it with that big knife of yours. That's the real bad guy, and we both know it. That black stuff. But what can we do about it? We're just pictures painted on the darkness. Go and save yourself, Domino, if saving yourself still means anything to you. To tell you the truth, I'm fed up with the whole thing. You can do whatever you want. I suspected that Richard's words were only part of an act to save himself. I was sure of it when he asked me, By the way, whatever happened to that document of your idea, your special plan, just out of curiosity, I don't really expect to see it. I was in a position that was frustrating beyond endurance. The worst of the swine was the one I had to let go. It seemed I had truly been beaten while he would continue to flourish. I'll tell you this, Richard. Keep watch on your computer screen. I'll send you something soon. Having said that, I put my knife back in my pocket and began my crawl along the lines of darkness that would lead me to only one place, one little room. 5. There he was, that bundle of bleeding bandages. The EEG was still active, portraying alarming surges of brain activity and glowing with an eerie incandescence. It was only by the colored lights of the medical appliances in that room that I could see anything at all. He looked like a mummy of someone whose every limb had been amputated to some extent. Tubes trailed out of a bandaged stump that had once been a whole arm, as well as from the wrappings which suggested a shapeless head beneath. A catheter snaked its way from under a blanket, dribbling into a plastic bag hung on the side of the bed. At the nurse's station down the quiet hallway, there was a bulletin board which had pinned to it some newspaper clippings that pertained to this patient. The initial accident report with a diagram, the investigation into the driving record of the guy at the wheel of that bus, the awful revelation that the victim still lived despite the incredible trauma sustained during the mishap, and a search goes on piece that put out a call to anyone who might be able to provide information that could identify the man who lay in a coma at Memorial Hospital. The bent frames of a pair of wire-rimmed eyeglasses that might have belonged to the unknown man had been found some distance from his body, but the lenses had either popped out or were lost among the shattered debris of the accident. And you were right, Richard. It was not an accident at all. As I looked down on that remnant of a human body, I was finally able to remember what happened. Rushing back to the office supply store to collect my forgotten packs of paper, I was very much preoccupied with the statement, my ultimate statement, that would eventually blacken those empty pages and eject them from the printer in my apartment. But the substance of this document still remained confused in my mind, 
its message frail and without force, its theme trite. They made me feel bad, to paraphrase your own words, Richard, so I bought some guns and killed them all. Such a statement, no matter how detailed and lengthy, simply would not do. I realized that even as I was running down the sidewalk to make it back to the office supply store before it closed. And I also knew that no words of greater weight or reason would occur to me once I had returned home. In a fraction of a second I became sick with the idea of sitting before my computer screen and tapping the same message over and over with only the slightest variations on the theme of, they made me feel bad so I bought some guns and killed them all. There was nothing in such a statement except self-humiliation, self-ridicule, and self-indictment. Anyone reading it would have thought, what a worthless piece of human wreckage, and what a shame about those seven people. There would have been no salvation for me in making such a statement, in committing such an act. But then I saw my salvation speeding down the street in the form of a bus headed for the suburbs. I picked up my pace. I raced toward the only salvation that I knew was available to me, and I timed it perfectly. By killing myself, I felt that I would also be killing all of you, killing every bad body on this earth. To my mind, at that moment, every swinish one of us in this puppet show of a world would be done with when that bus made contact with me. Every suicide is a homicide or many homicides, thwarted. My rage, my inner empire of murderous hate, had never been so intense as in those moments before I met that oncoming bus. Soon my statement would be made, not with words but with the violent action which is the only thing anyone really attended to, if only for a day or so. And the theme of my statement, to whom it may concern, I hereby refuse to be a swine living in a world of swine that was built by swine and belongs only to swine. This swine has been fed full of his swinish ambitions, his swinish schemes, and over and above all, his swinish fears and obsessions. Therefore I forfeit my part of this estate to my heirs in the kingdom of the swine. That would seem to have been the end of it. I never suspected that I was going to be put to further use. I never suspected that there was a grander, if not exactly grand, scheme of things. Not for a moment did I consider that I would continue to be manipulated and conspired against, that I would become the instrument of greater manipulations and conspiracies, all the while being kept in the dark about what was really going on, about what should have been the real subject of my ultimate statement as I now attempt to deliver it to you, not one of whom will ever benefit from it. People do not know and cannot face the things that go on in this world, the secret nightmares that are suffered by millions every day, and the excruciating paradox, the nightmarish obscenity of being something that does not know what it is and yet believes that it does know, something that in fact is nothing but a tiny particle that forms the body of the great black swine which wallows in a great river of blackness that to us looks like sunrises and skyscrapers, like all the knotted events of the past and the unraveling of these knots in the future, like birthdays and funerals, like satellites and cell phones and rockets launched into space, like nations and peoples, like the laws of nature and the laws of humanity, like families and friends, like everything, including these words that I write. Because this document, this supposedly ultimate statement, is only a record of incidents destined for the garbage can of the incredible, and rightly so. These incidents are essentially no different from any others in the world. They occurred in a particular sequence. They were witnessed and sometimes documented, but in the end they have no significance, no sense, no meaning, at least as I, and you, and you, and you, imagine these vacuous concepts. All that remains to me, to my comatose body lying in a darkened hospital room, is to put an end to the thing beneath all those bandages. I'm sure that I'll be allowed to do so. My work is finally done.
Yet having gone to all the trouble to concoct this statement, I cannot resist the ludicrous temptation to throw it out to the crowd. I told Richard I would send him something on his computer, although it won't be the documentation for a new product idea, which I destroyed in both its digital and hard copy forms. And whatever satisfaction it may bring to detectives white and black, I will also forward a copy to them, so that they can match the fingerprints on the handle of this knife I hold over my own body to those that wait for them in my apartment, and so that they may know something of the atrocious wonders of this world. On Monday morning, all the printers in the company will be spewing out these useless pages. Perhaps this occurrence will bring on the bad publicity which those merchants of stale information, those data pushers, so anxiously desire to avoid, since the company is now struggling for its life in the corporate arena. I am now struggling for my death. That's the only thing that matters. I do not regret having annihilated seven persons any more than the fact that I'll never regain that lost hour which was taken from me six months ago. I make no excuses for my acts, and I beg no forgiveness or reprieve for the lives I've eliminated. A curse on them. These are the words of a swine who seeks only his own slaughter under the slicing serrated blade of a buckskinner hunting knife. A curse on me. I was weak and afraid and I ended up as a deadly weapon wielded by a dark hand that not even I, that no one, will ever see. A curse on it. I remember how wonderful it felt to die the little death of that cockroach in my apartment. I can only hope to know that feeling to its fullest when the moment comes and the river rushes in to drown me in its blackness. Perhaps a swine whose savage work is finally done may be allowed this much. I cannot wait to tear into the tender flesh of my last victim and with a single slash kill two. I cannot wait to be dead. I cannot wait. I am not afraid anymore. <laughs>